Martin Bonner, thank you so much uh, for taking time to come to the Economic Affairs Committee. Pleasure. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, perhaps uh, I could uh, begin by um, asking uh, the first question, which is um, how concerned we, should we be uh, by the privacy implications of central bank digital currencies? Do you want to go first, Mr. Bonner? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so in our experience, there's no sustainable innovation without trust. And therefore, to get the benefits that these kind of initiatives can offer, privacy has to be considered right from the start, embedded within it, so people build trust and are therefore willing to embrace them. So we do think privacy is vitally important for the success of these kind of initiatives. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, I hate to start off in this vein because you'll just think I'm an annoying consultant, but. It depends what you mean by privacy, and it depends what you mean by central bank digital currency. So I would first of all say... The sort of answer we'd expect from a politician. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think one thing that doesn't come over is that there are different kinds of digital currencies. And if we're talking about a retail digital currency for the use of the public, then Stephen is 100% correct, and we shouldn't rush into things, the potential for making a huge privacy mistake is, is very real. Um, if we're talking about wholesale central bank digital currencies for the use of institutions, then I think um, none of this applies. We, they're, they're already covered by all the relevant regulations. And if we're talking about other kinds of digital currencies, for example, the sort of industrial digital currencies envisaged by the Germans, then they would have very different privacy because they, they would be related to sectors and industries. So uh, um, it's not an easy yes or no, but if you're talking about retail, as per the G7 principles that were published earlier in the week, Stephen is 100% correct. And so you'd be against it for that reason? Against retail digital yeah. currency? Yeah. I would be against rushing into retail digital currency. I'm a very strong supporter of retail digital currency, um, but I'm acutely aware of the potential for a colossal privacy catastrophe if we don't And how it. would you avoid that then if you think it's a good idea? Well, the, um, I don't know if you'd agree about this, but it, the, the issue is largely to do with the wallets where the currency will be stored and the, KY, the know your customer, anti-money laundering, yes, exactly. counter-terrorist financing, political suppose. So it's about the wallets and I think the suggestion within the G7 recommendations, which is I mean, I can summarise it as saying, as long as somebody knows who you are, not everybody has to know who you are, seems to me to provide the sort of compromise that we would need to make it practical. Mm. Uh, this uh, uh, committee, subcommittee has been very struck by the way in which a lot of the protections have been dismantled by HMRC and their desire to close what they call the tax gap. So why are you confident that um, that, for example, would not, as we've seen, um, already HMRC can get access to people's bank accounts and so on, surely it would be very tempting. Well, I, I can construct an easy example, I think, to illustrate the point. So, so let's imagine my bank gives me some sort of digital wallet, um, but it doesn't say Dave Birch. I, I can pick a name, like I can with Gmail or Hotmail or something, right? So, so I'm, 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 you know, Manchester City fan number one wallet. And uh, I can go about my business buying things, selling things, transferring money around. If um, HMRC or any other legitimate law enforcement agency has some concerns because of monitoring that I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, uh, then they can go and take a warrant to the bank and say, well, who is Manchester City number one? And the bank will tell them. So knowing that I'm Dave Birch, all parties to a transaction knowing that I'm Dave Birch, and somebody knowing that I'm Dave Birch, which can be disclosed under due process, in my head those are quite separate things. And the former is, has great dangers associated with it. Okay. Uh, Mr Bonner, do you want to add anything? I, mean, I think our sense is that the rules and principles we have that apply to the existing banking system can probably be applied sensibly to any new initiatives, and as long as they follow those same principles and controls, we're likely to achieve a broadly equivalent. And you're confident that if there were a central bank digital currency, there would be an existing system? I mean, I think 
clearly at this point there aren't the details necessary to answer that specifically when we get to the specifics we'll be able to provide guidance to those who do it but I think there are certainly proposed ideas that would achieve that there are proposals and thoughts out there that might impringe on those principles hence the need to get privacy considered up front so it is embedded within it but I think it is possible to construct one which has an equal level of protection as the existing banking system under the principles and laws we have at the moment. Lord Bridges. So just to build on um, your point Mr Birch, already payment companies and banks have an enormous amount of data obviously so to me as a citizen what is the real difference between the step towards a CBDC and what we currently have? I think to I a, I think to the to the man in the street, um, I'm not sure it would make any difference. Um, if you ask people whether they're concerned about privacy, they they say yes. Um, as is well known, if you ask them for their password in return for a Mars bar, they'll give it to you. So. I think it's, it's more a sort of seat belty type thing, where as an industry we want to build in the right privacy enhancing technologies to prevent future abuse, rather than requiring citizens to take care themselves. And if you look at the extent of the frauds being perpetrated in account takeovers and all this, sort of, it's clear that the current system can't quite be working as well as we would hope. People's personal information is too readily available and if we can take some steps in that direction I think it would be a good thing. Right. And Mr. I think the, the core difference you may see is currently there's quite a fragmented approach to these data so it is out there it can be gathered but there are positive and negatives about that. It's inefficient to gather that data at the moment so you could get if you centralize that you get efficiencies which can be positive. Equally there are benefits of a fragmented system that you have higher levels of consumer choice that if there are failures of parts within the system it is unlikely the whole system fails. So there is a, a sort of eggs in all one basket has great benefit. You can look after those eggs very carefully, you know where they are, but equally you could have additional risk if, the, if there is a problem in there then its impact is likely to be higher. Do you think, do you think we should be aiming, well first of all is it possible and second if it is should we be aiming to get the same level of privacy that one currently has with cash, which obviously is completely anonymised? I don't want to make myself awfully unpopular right at the beginning, but, um, but I, I think no. I think the, uh, the extent of the criminality, money laundering, tax evasion, bribery and everything else that goes with cash is, is a little out of place in a modern society. Um, and it shouldn't be beyond, you know, it should not be on the wit of, 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 of us to design a better system, um, which balances, um, you know, the different goals of the different stakeholders. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think the Bank of England's own figures are something like, is it, I think a sixth of the cash in circulation is used for transactional purposes. I mean, it's, I mean, I think in Germany, nine in ten banknotes that are printed in are never used in transactions. So, I mean, I wouldn't like to speculate as to what the money is actually used for, but, mm -hmm. you know, we can apply our imagination, I think. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, I mean, I think, as we said, the, if the principles of privacy are applied, you can generate something that, you know, we have a proportionate system that allows us to operate other parts of the financial system that are, have large amounts of personal data, we would expect to see a similar level of control applied to this. It wouldn't be the same as cash. There are advantages and disadvantages, but you could have something that fitted within the principles of the current data protection law. And just to quickly jump to a specific, because in the Bahamas, for example, how, how do you view their approach to this? What's the, um, Mr. Birch, if you're able to comment, or either of you able to comment, what, what, is, what is the strength or the weaknesses of their approach? Obviously there it is. The Harmian sand dollar, yeah. I think you're referring to. Um, I think I would prefer a more distributed solution. So, so I, and much as the Bank of England actually has already said in, in relation to di uh, retail digital currencies, um, having banks and other regulated institutions distribute the uh, digital cash to people and take care of the KYC and related initiatives um, is probably the right way forward. Um, I think aggregate centralised tracking is probably appropriate in those circumstances, but not the tracking of individual transactions. 
Right. I think. In sorry, just to pick you up. Sorry, just to be a layman's question. Then, are you saying that in your ideal system, banks as currently would be providing the <coughs> KYC AML function that they do now? I, I would say banks and other regulated financial right. institutions. I mean, you, right. you could you could imagine specialist institutions like payment institutions or, or something doing that work as well. And also, I think, I mean, and it's not completely relevant to your question, but I would just sort of flag up. Um, you'd have to present me with some pretty concrete evidence that the current system actually works um, before we decided to replicate it in CBDC. I imagine CBDC as being built as a parallel system, not on top of the existing system. And if you look at the amount of money that's spent on KYC, AML, CTF, PEP in the current system compared to the um, criminal funds that are intercepted, it's, it's not a cost-benefit analysis that would be considered acceptable in most businesses. Any other comments on that? Uh, it's not a, not a product we've looked at Thank in great detail, is it? It's not UK-based. Uh, Mr. Bonner, when, when you were talking about baskets and eggs, I, I was reminded of Churchill's remark about not wanting to put all these baskets in one egg, which was about the comet, I think, at the time. Um, we would be putting all our baskets in one egg, would we not? And um, What are the dangers of people being able to hack into the system and... I mean, is it sensible? I think you, you sort of hinted that that might be... I mean, you would be very vulnerable unless you had um, impenetrable systems. And as some of the most secure um, uh, uh, computer systems in the world regularly get hacked by 14-year-olds, um, how confident would you be about those baskets in the one egg? I mean, I think uh, in our work looking beyond privacy into some of our critical infrastructure and security oversight, we do see that there are weaknesses in many parts of infrastructure. It is very hard to build a system that is perfect forever. If you have a large, widely distributed system with many players within it, that may uh, add points of weakness that allow entry into the system that can spread throughout the system. If you are aware of the value of an asset, you can then protect it appropriately. But that's probably a question for someone like the NCSC and their work to give you judgment around that. But it would definitely have to be something considered because one of the advantages of cash is it continues to work should all your systems fail. So thinking about what the fallback would be should the system have a problem would clearly be a key part of the design to make sure it is resilient in terms of those kind of challenges. Okay, Lord Fox. Uh, um, yeah, before I get on to questions from the paper, I'm coming back to a couple of things you said, Ms. Mr. Birch. At the beginning, you made a sort of St. Augustus um, claim, you know, make uh, digital, retail digital, but not yet. Um, you talked about people giving away their password for a Mars bar, and, and you also said we can design a better system. So I would say is, well, if we do have a retail digital currency, what's the Mars bar? And also, what do you mean by better? Better for whom? Uh, so yes, I'm using I, I'm using better in a, in a very horrible um, mechanical sense of of lowering the overall total social cost so of payments in the country. Less friction. Uh, well, less less cost. But I recognise in the retail case there are different stakeholders, law enforcement, and so on. And I think it will take time to come to the right balance. I think in the retail case we don't have what you might call a burning platform. You know, it, it, but, but, it, you, but you did say you were a fan of it, so I'm wondering yes, I why am. you were a fan of it and, and, and what the benefit is. it just the fact that it's, it's more efficient, or are there Mars bars for, for the retail customers of these, of these currencies? At the retail level, I, I would say there are probably kind of three areas that we would want to think of as benefits in this case. So the first, which I don't particularly want to, I'm sure you don't particularly want to talk about today, is political. Um, there are some issues to do. I mean, you could imagine the situation if everybody in the UK has a, has a little app on their phone and they find it more convenient to use digital dollars than to use actual mm, sterling. Absolutely. That would have implications. Yeah. So there's a competitive issue. Yes, yeah, so there are some political, which we, obviously yeah. we don't want to talk about. But obviously, we, you know, we would like a, a well-constructed central bank digital currency to form uh, sterling that um, adds to our... You know, we would like people overseas to use that. There are the economic issues to do with social inclusion, um, to do with sustainability, to do with all these other issues, and we would certainly want to see, or I would have thought we would want to see a digital currency built to support all of those goals. Yes. And then on the purely technical side to this issue of resilience uh, that His Lordship referred to just now, I, and I think a great many other people, don't envisage the 
digital currency system being built on top of the existing system. I think the existing system is already being overhauled and developed as it is. I think for this vital piece of critical national infrastructure, we would want it constructed as a parallel system. So the overall resilience of the UK payment systems goes up. You're probably aware of the economists John Kay's comments on the sort of general uselessness of the financial sector, but the astonishing utility of the payment system. That is the, you know, if, if, if the stock exchange stops working for a couple of days, and, you know, but if the payment system stops for two minutes, it's it, I mean, vital. This, this isn't one of the questions here, and I think we've covered most of my question, but if, if you're building a completely new um, infrastructure, aren't we in danger of new wine in old skins because the rest of the banking system is built on almost decades and decades no, of legacy? I, 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 I have to say, I, I, I disagree with that because, and again, this may be a too technical version, but the existing system is about electronic money. And electronic money lives in bank accounts, essentially, and moves between them. Cash lives in your pocket or in your car or in your drawer. And similarly, electronic cash would live in devices. It would live in your mobile phone, your television, you know, wherever else. But it wouldn't live in bank accounts. So if I send you some money from my Barclays account to your NatWest account, um, those claims are being transmitted through the existing system. And we have all sorts of you know, measures to look after it and make, although they don't seem to be working terribly well at the moment, judging by the figures on, on uh, authorised push payment fraud. But if I send you an electronic pound from me to you, it goes from my wallet to your wallet, and that's the end of the story. It doesn't go through banks or other intermediaries or so on. So it, it, it's very crucially different, in my opinion. And, and if this was travelling across international <coughs> boundaries... How would the confidentiality, sorry, the privacy issue be affected? And perhaps, Stephen, if you wanted to come in first on that. Yeah, so we, um, we see, like the G7 paper that, that David's referenced, there's also the OECD uh, 108 plus principles. We see there's a long and strong push internationally to come up with common standards around this area so that we can have the free flow of data and this kind of initiative, but with trust. So there's definitely a direction to building that as much as possible. But it's not a given unless we negotiate... No. Um, standards probably earlier rather than later. Yes. I think it has incredible degrees of complexity around it when the, you start that talking That would be about my it. assumption. Because, if, you know, if I, if I send some money to France, I mean, let's just say under the FATF, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, travel rules it stands at the moment, if I send some money from me to my friend in France, we have to send my name and address and inside yes. leg measurement and everything else that goes with it. Um, and I guess we're okay to do that because we think France will probably act responsibly with that data, and, but that's not a given. Um, and it's certainly not true of a great many countries in the world where you're essentially forced to, to, to send personal data in order to get anything done. Um, and it's very difficult to... Cons For example, what we regard as privacy, that, that has some cultural context and political context, which may not apply to other people. So if we say, well, we, we think central bank digital currency should have these privacy things attached to it, um, that might be completely unacceptable in other places, and, 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 and vice versa. So once we start talking internationally, I think it's, it is very problematic because I, I'm slightly uncomfortable with the idea of forcing people to transmit personally identifiable information alongside a payment. Um, I'm not sure that enhances our position in the long run. Um, of course, if France has a maximum limit, the amount of cash you can um, bring in and use. I think um, I'm right in saying in terms of how much actual cash cash you can use. Um, turning that on its head, is, is there one way of kind of um, minimising some of the impact is, is, is to have a limit, uh, a lower limit, for which yeah. the, the, the identification of people using electronic um, digital cash, uh, digital money, aren't aren't revealing their details. Yes, in other words, I, having a de minimis. Uh, I I don't feel that's a valid, uh, a useful way forward. Because if we say, if if we say, for example, look, you don't have to do KYC for wallets that hold less than five hundred pounds. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. If I'm an if, if I'm an international drug dealing Nazi child pornography smuggling, uh, no good. Um, I'll just have a thousand of those wallets. So without a, without a working digital identity infrastructure, which Stephen and I, of 
agree we're still some distance from in this country, uh, but I think we both agree on the priority um, of it. Uh, without a proper digital identity infrastructure, you can't make the thing work. If you allow anonymous wallets of any form, you're essentially allowing anonymity. And I think the, personally, I think the long-term danger... So if I open something great. for my for my daughter of five, five digital pounds in it, I've still got to go through the same hoops as someone doing five million pounds. Yes, but there are other ways of reducing those costs. I mean, at the moment, if I go to... I mean, I've been at Barclays for... I don't, want, I don't want to say how many years, but I mean quite a... I'm similarly unmoved <laughs> in my bank account. Um, but if I go around the corner to, to Nat West to open an account, they'll treat me like I just got off the boat. Right, exactly. You know? I mean, I can't use my Barclays reputation in order to minimise the cost of transactions elsewhere in the financial system. And that doesn't seem quite right. So I'm sure we can find other way with a proper well, today we have infrastructure. Both. To date, we haven't, and there's correct. And you say there's a big cost involved. Anyway, Chairman. Sorry, uh, Lord Bridges. I think you wanted to come. Sorry, in. can I just quickly pick up this word? Sorry. So I understand you correctly. You're saying that we, we set up a CBDC system that runs parallel to the existing system. Yes, that, that's right. So in the new CBD system, the actual payment system is entirely new, or is it using, in some shape or form, the current payment system, but remodified and redesigned? And the reason I'm asking is I'm when the um, Bank for International Settlements has looked at all this. They wrote, and I quote, existing retail payment systems designs, e.g. those supporting cards or credit card transfers, exchanging originator and beneficiary information at every step in the payment chain, could struggle to offer the level of privacy required for a CBDC system without redesign. Right. Is, that, is, that, is that your justification, therefore? We have to sort of start I'm, all over again. I'm not sure if I'd say justify, but, but the point is the point is correct. Right. which is that we have an existing electronic money system which has evolved over many years to provide a pretty terrific service. You know, when I, when I go to the train station and stick my card in the machine, it works, and I never think twice about it. There's no obvious reason for disrupting that. Um, <coughs> if we want a, for, for other reasons, if we want to have a digital currency system in place, which I think we do, um, there's no reason we would build it the same way. Those things were, those things were built many, many years ago. Um, and I'll give you one very simple example, which is it took a great many years for computer chips to show up on your credit card in order to enhance the security and so on. But to all intents and purposes, everybody has one of those chips inside their phone now. So, I mean, why would you, why would you put chip, you know, why wouldn't you use, just use the chips inside the phones? That Not everyone has got a phone. <laughs> Not everyone. I'm still just struggling. Though. I mean, I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying about the design. I'm just trying to think through the benefit. I mean, at the moment, I can go in and I can zap my card very quickly on a um, uh, merchant's um, terminal and pay. And I'm just trying to just see if you've got the twin tracks, what is going to attract me to as a customer. It's back to that Mars bar, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you'll probably want to talk to Andrew in the next session, but I would imagine merchants would be strongly motivated to incentivize people away from the existing system, which I think I read an article from Andrew about every other day about quite how much it costs merchants to support the existing system. Um, but these issues um, to do with privacy and other things, that I think, are just as important. If I was to pick out, for, for the purposes of the discussion, if I was to pick out a single reason for doing it, I think the Bank of England was right to point towards innovation. Um, or to put it very crudely, five pound notes don't have an API. If we had a central bank digital currency system in place, which involves no credit risk to anybody, it's cleared funds that are used at all times, and that system is a platform for innovation, for new products and services, for people in the, in the proverbial garages um, to build things which none of us can imagine at the moment, that would be a much greater net benefit to UK PLC than the... I mean, the cost savings are substantial, you know, if we're not driving trucks around and filling up ATMs and using all of those single-use plastics to wrap banknotes and so on. Of course, those cost savings are real. But the, the net benefits to UK PLC, I would think, will come more on the innovation side, building new products and services. Lord Monks. Yes, you, uh, to, to Mr Birch. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the fact that there's uh, considerable suspicion about holders of, of uh, paper currency in both... You mentioned the UK and Germany... <clears throat> is it uh, uh, not absolutely possible that the a new digital currency 
could suffer from exactly the same problems. It, the more that you guarantee anonymity, the more that you guarantee privacy, the more that you try and say this is safe and secure, the more that the door opens to people and ne'er-do-wells uh, ne of one form or another. Isn't that a major, a major factor? Well, I agree with you completely. I mean, I th but that's why Stephen and I don't use the words privacy <coughs> and anonymity interchangeably. Um, I, I am strongly in favour of, uh, of building in real privacy into the infrastructure, not, not relying on people to do the right thing, but actually making it part of the structure. We, and we have the privacy enhancing technologies at our disposal, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? There are certainly innovations in that space that can assist with this. Yeah. Um, but that's not the same thing as anonymity. Anonymity is unconditional, and I'm, I think the dangers of that are far too great. But surely, so, you, you, to stop it, you need some sort of regulation. You need somebody okay. keeping an eye on the different uh, movements. At the moment, the banks do know something about uh, money laundering, and probably not enough, but they do. Um, who's going to keep an eye on this? Uh, I mean, this? Keep, keeping an eye on... Um, so if you use the example I gave earlier on, so I, I have a wallet which says I'm Manchester City fan and I'm sending it to a friend of mine who is Chelsea fan. So in the system, it's Manchester City fan and Chelsea fan. It's not Dave Birch. I mean, no one can spy. And... Now, let's suppose the monitor, keeping an eye on, in, in my mind, in this future world, you're talking about machine learning and processing vast quantities of data, which we didn't used to be able to do, but we can now. So if the robot spots that Manchester City fan seems to be sending an awful lot of money every couple of days, I don't know, to a cave in the Bora Bora Mountains or something, it can put up a flag and then law enforcement under proper procedures and processes can obtain a warrant and go to Barclays and say, who's Manchester City fan? And Barclays, because they're a law-abiding organisation, will tell them it's Dave Birch. I can't, I can't use it to get away. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely in favour of that monitoring using the most automated techniques immanageable. But what I'm against is the routine invasion of privacy without the you know, proper, I don't know what you, the word for it would be, proper authorization. authorization. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. I just wonder, um, that kind of power in the hands of totalitarian governments is quite frightening, isn't it? Well, correct. But if we had a totalitarian government, <laughs> I mean, I don't think this is a flip statement, but I mean, if we have a totalitarian government, we've got lots more to worry about than, you know, them working out what I'm buying down at the corner shop. Mm. Anyway, just as a just as a follow, -up, um, I mean, I've got this this vision from the, the, the questions that Chris was asking earlier of a kind of a single currency emerging out of all this. There's competitive uh, central bank currencies, and some are more attractive than others. Some might be because the regulation is laxer than others. Is this, is this not some gateway to some international currency, uh, of some world currency or whatever? World currency, I think, is un unlikely, but you're, you're certainly right to raise the issue of um, currency hegemony. In fact, I wrote a book about it last year, so I'm rather glad you did raise uh, the issue. Um, Yes, I mean, we, we, I mean, we're not here to discuss the politics of it, but it's very clear that the use of different currencies in international transactions represents a form of an extension of state power, which we might be for or against in different circumstances. But um, it would certainly be the case that were there to be widely available working digital dollars, digital pounds, digital yuan, um, there might be a great many currencies around the world that would just disappear because nobody would use them. I mean, there are many countries where people would much prefer to hold, you know, US dollars or euros than the local currency. It's rather obvious, I would have thought, you know. Um, Lord Fox. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's two sorts of data. There's the individual personal data and then there's the bulk data. And, and what we're seeing with the NHS is we're being assured that their private data is not being sold or parlayed. But in fact, the bulk data, the, the, the population bulk data on health is, is becoming increasingly valuable. It would seem to me that the bulk economic data of this nature would itself become quite, quite valuable. Who owns that and how should it be used? 
So um, in order for that bulk data to become bulk data, we have in the, in the UK rules this idea of pseudonymous data and anonymous data. Yes. So at a high enough level, it becomes anonymous. One of the fascinating things about payment data and cash data is that it's generally quite easy to re-identify people. The buying the train well, tickets. Uh, actually, it's the same is true with health data. Actually, yes, well. indeed. indeed. <coughs> and hence, a very li- high level of concern amongst citizens about yes. how their data is being yeah. used. But we do see when there is clear transparency about what it's going to be used for and how it's going to be used, people are very supportive of those goals. So if you explain, mm-hmm. we're going to aggregate the data about transactions to better plan the economy, to... We sort companies. of know who owns the health data. I'm, I'm interested to know who we think owns the, the bulk data of, 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 of a digital currency. Is it the, is it the bank? Is it, is, it, is it the retail banks? or whom? I mean, it would depend on the implementation. I think if there is the central one without the banks issuing the wallets, then the data would be held centrally and they would be the data controller having that data. So the, the, the institution running the central currency would have that. You can see a model where as David suggested for the KYC, the banks have some of that data and some of that, and then they... But it ceases to be data. bulk data at that point when it becomes balkanised or it becomes less usable if it becomes yeah. balkanised I mean, around the, the retail banks. Well, or certainly at the moment that data within those banks is used and is useful as a sample of the, yeah. the whole set, but that, back to the basket of eggs, if you bring that all together, you have a comprehensive view, which is probably more useful, but you do then have aggregate data that could be at risk. But you would agree that this, this would have value to, to commercial concerns as well as making government decisions? There's this bulk data. I, I think there's definitely an extreme level of interest in this kind of data and in our work in things like uh, some of the data brokers, we've identified that some of that use of that data is not, historically may not have followed UK law and that's where we've done our work to reduce that. But there are ways in which users really benefit from having their data used in innovative ways, particularly <coughs> if it is anonymised, that provides them a level of comfort. Okay, uh, Lord Monk said, had you finished? Yes, yeah. Um, uh, I thought so. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lord Stone. I, I just had a follow up. Oh, yes, sorry. Well, and, I, uh, and then oh, well, yeah, do, do both. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, w- would you envisage somebody preventing you from you, Dave Birch, opening uh, an account which is Manchester City fan one, two, three, four? They'd know if they knew you were David Birch, then they would prevent you from having a load of account, a load of wallets. Yes, that's a that's a that's a, I, and I don't mean this in a horror. That's a very clever question, which is very difficult to answer because of sanctions and so on. So, in other words, Barclays know that I'm Manchester City fan one. Okay, I can maybe go to HSBC and open an account as Manchester City fan one because Barclays have already done the KYC. But it's not Manchester City fan number one that's on the sanctions list, it's Dave Birch. So how would HSBC know that I'm on that sanctions list? So in other words, you have to have, and I hate to sound like a broken record on this, you have to have a proper digital identity infrastructure to make this all work, Mm. because you've got to sanction, I mean, my name, Dave Birch, and my address, those are attributes, they're not my identity, you know, they, so you need a way of sanctioning me uh, not those attributes, which would so you're, you're absolutely right to highlight that, and there's no simple answer to it. it need, this, this is one of the reasons why I think we we don't need to rush into this. Why we need to think about this a little more. Thank you. So, so that was my follow-up question on, <laughs> on Lord Monk. Just before, you, is the government actually working on a digital identity system, to your knowledge? Digital identity system. Yeah. Um, that's a complicated question. So the new DCMS digital identity framework, I think it's that's pottering along, right? What's the difference between a framework and a system? Well, I mean the framework. I mean the question. Years. My question. <laughs> my question is really: Is the government working on this, and are they doing so in order to deal with the point that you've just made? I, I think I would. I, I don't. I, I think the DCMS's decision to opt for a more framework-based approach is the right decision. I'm not so, asking that. <laughs> I'm asking whether you think that they're doing that with a view to preparation to deal with the problem that you've just identified. I, I couldn't say. You'd have to ask them. Right. Uh, okay. Sorry, Lord Snow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we like to think the Bank of England as being as little politicised as possible. I mean, central banks are politicised, but we try to do our best to keep that level of 
politicisation down. Um, we're talking about structures where they actually would take on more responsibilities, one way or the other, of the kind that we've just been uh, discussing, um, particularly around privacy data protection. Um, I guess that would up the degree of politicisation. Do you think that it would do so to an extent that would be worrying? And I think the idea that our key institutions should respect the laws of the land, including the privacy ones, is not that controversial or worrying. So I think you could, as long as it sits under the framework of the existing laws and approaches, as other elements of the financial system that indeed the bank and treasury operate parts of, I think you can operate that without concern as long as you've built in privacy from the start and given people comfort you're making the right choice and fitted in with the existing legal frameworks we have. Don't you think it, it, it's rather big? I mean, for many of us, what the state knows about us and what it does with it is at the heart of uh, the mm. political relationship between the individual and the state. It's, I, I just, I'm worrying, I, I'm just slightly complacent in the way you put your answer. Well, I, I, given we as an organisation dedicate our time and effort to make sure those things are in place, I hope I don't come across as complacent. We absolutely do put time and effort into that. But I think it moving from a number of banks where the data can be collected to a central point where the data can be collected, we face those same risks in the distributed system just with slightly added friction. So obviously we're very keen to ensure that the right principles and rules are applied, whether the system is distributed or whether it's centralised. Being the data controller of such a large set of valuable data definitely comes with responsibilities, but I think we've seen when people take those responsibilities seriously, design it well, and build the trust, that can work very well. Yes, there have definitely been circumstances in the commercial and the government world where things haven't built that trust and it has caused disruption and delay to important initiatives. So we hope that people will take advice and guidance to meet those requirements yeah. to make it easier to deliver these things. But it, it is not... It is something they absolutely need to take seriously, so apologies if I... Yeah. No, no, I, I didn't mean to overdo that word. Um, you know, but we live in a country where um, people, for understandable reasons, are rather, uh, would, would be rather antipathetic to identity cards. And doesn't that underline just how sensitive we are to these kinds of issues? And I think when we see initiatives like this, uh, as David mentioned, mm -hmm. privacy is the top issue that people have as concerns yeah. around this. I'm sure it's why you've invited us here today and why we are engaged with the Bank of England and Treasury um, working groups on this, because absolutely it is of grave concern to people that this, if it doesn't have the controls and constraints that we all expect and have embedded in law, then it is not a positive contribution and okay. it will not succeed. So... Absolutely. I think it is vital that people take privacy seriously on this. Thank you. And I had one other politicised or political issue here, which David Birch, you actually raised, I thought rightly so, and you assumed we didn't want to, we didn't want to talk about it. Perhaps we do. And that is that uh, if these kinds of uh, facilities around the world make some uh, currencies still more attractive than others, then that increases seniorage, doesn't it? I mean, the reason that the U.S. has run, been able to run deficits mm. for decades and benefited from that, you know, it, it gets goods and it gives people bits of paper. Uh, would this accentuate that problem? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's a factor which is not unknown in the U.S. And, and also because of the sums involved, relatively small falls in the proportion of dollars used in international transactions translates into significantly higher financing costs for, for the US. You know, the, because, because the dollar is used in such an overwhelming majority of international transactions, the demand for dollars and dollars denominated securities is much higher than it otherwise would be. This is the exorbitant privilege that, uh, that America accrues. And if that was to fall, then the cost of financing the U.S. deficit would go up. And that's, I mean, those figures are, are widely available. But I think there are other more sensitive issues that I'm not qualified to comment on to do with the extension of soft power and the extent to which you can use the financial system as, um, as a method of censure or, or, or support, which um, I, mean, I think everybody understands, but it's a, it's a complex issue.
It, w it would be likely to increase the potential mm. of seniorage, in other words, the US, if it were the US, being able to get... Uh, I mean, there are so many different scenarios. That, I, mean, it, I mean, for example, I mean, again, I'm not making political points, just illustrating. Suppose it turned out that along the Belt and Road, for example, the, the digital yuan became the sort of standard currency along there. Um, that, would, that would obviously be very good uh, uh, for China. Um, in other parts of the world, I mean, let's imagine, I mean, there are parts of the developing world where, for example, Facebook essentially is the internet, and some sort of Facebook money might become very attractive to most people. So, so there, are, there are lots of different scenarios which mm. you need somebody much more well-versed in the economics than me to, to, to talk about how, but, but I think your sense of the fact there's an unknown here is absolutely correct. I mean, if we don't do it, um, will we be at a long-term disadvantage? Probably yes, we will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Lord Bridges. Sorry, just to come back, uh, Mr. Birch, to the point in response to Lord Stern's initial question about digital identity. Can I just absolutely clarify, are you saying that to make a CBDC work, you need to have some form of digital identity framework so that the individual who is applying for the digital wallet is part of that framework? And if so, what data needs to be in it? So to the first part of the question, I think I would want to say yes. I'm looking nervously at Stephen in case I'm... Um, I, I personally think, yes, we, need a, we do need a, a, an infrastructure to make this work. Um, to the second part about what data you would need, I'm not, I'm not completely sure. I think it, it so much depends on the implementation. Yeah. And we've discussed yeah. here running yeah. a parallel one separately. There are models where these do sit more embedded in the existing system, and then you could leverage some of those identities used within that. Clearly, if we had an effective digital identity, that would make a number of things a lot, a lot great easier. Although, of course, if we then try and do international elements of this, how that identity scheme from one country would trust others becomes another part of the data flows and trust and data that would need to be had. So there are, there are many models where having it is advantageous. I do think you could construct a scenario of running something in this space that didn't require it. Whether that would be the right thing to do is a little beyond my remit, but I think you could design ones that didn't have it, but it would be a lot easier if we did have so that. If you did, to, just to assume that we followed your ideal scenario, you have the existing track and you have a new track, all of us would need to apply to be on the digital framework system, whatever we identity framework system, well, whatever it is, and that, that's the only way we would be able to make it work, correct? Well, I, I'd hazard a guess that all of you have already got bank accounts. In which you'd case, be the bank using is that data done. that would be KYC and everything else. Yeah. Just it would just plug straight in. I, I but think it would, so. Yeah. It would, and that would suffice. <clears throat> right. Would that okay. suffice? I, I think quite probably, um, but we'd need to think it through. Would it be very unkind of me to suggest that um, you both seem quite enthusiastic about um, the prospects of this currency, but you aren't really able? to explain how the system would operate without avoiding some pretty big risks? I could certainly explain how a system could operate. Um, whether it would be the system or not is a much more... I mean, there are so many different issues coming in here. So if you said to me, could I take a piece of paper and sketch out roughly how I think it should work? Well, yes, I could. I, I mean, I was struck, for example, I asked you about... Uh, this in the hands of a totalitarian regime, yeah, yeah. and later you said, well, perhaps China might actually um, get ahead of us if we didn't um, uh, move forward on this. And um, I certainly regard China as a totalitarian regime, um, and the effect on 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 liberty and on uh, world trade, etc., could be quite chilling. And uh, you seem very relaxed about this. Well, I mean, I think. If you're asking me, you know, on, on balance, in most circumstances, would I prefer to use a Canadian digital currency or a Chinese digital currency? I might opt for the Canadian one because they have a track record of being concerned about privacy issues and have strong data protection laws. Um, is that true for everybody in the world? I think it would be, it would be wrong of me to say that. I think, 
Some Lord people might prefer um, that. Well, really, sort of carrying on a bit, I mean, in, in one of your answers, Mr. Mr. Bonner, you, you, you reeled off digital inclusion as being one of the potential benefits of, uh, of, of, of a retail digital currency. Um, meantime, we're having to establish everybody who is even included now is going to start from, if not year zero, then, then going to have to rebuild their profile in the, in the new system. How will the people who are already not plugged into the system some s suddenly, magically, be, be, be attracted to a system um, that, you know, again, it's coming back into what's in it for them. I mean, presumably if they've got no choice, if you're saying it's the people who aren't plugged into the system have to do it because, of, because they don't have money, then that is... It's not exactly digital inclusion. It's, 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 um, it, it's kind of marching people into the digital world, whether they want to or not. So, I mean, we should call it what it is, if it's that. Or is there something else that would draw these people um, moth-like towards the light of a digital currency? Uh, I think that the issue is actually a rather more distinct. I think inclusion is a... I mean, we already live in a country where basic bank accounts are, are, you know, anybody can go and get a bank, and there are a million people that don't have those. Well, that's, so that's are, kind of my point. Are, so you're yeah. talking about digital conscription, really. Right, right. so there are yeah. clearly digital okay. conscription. I'm, I'm going to steal that. That's such a great... <laughs> I want to use that. I mean, look, look, we, we, we shut off people's analogue telly when it was for the better of the nation. So we shut off the analogue money. Well, I'm just saying it would be a possibility. But on inclusion, I just want to very specifically make one point on inclusion. What people who are excluded need is not a bank account. A, a, a bank account is a very complicated and no, it's expensive an identity is way. What need. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. So, so I need, I need a like if I if I get my first, what I need is a way to get paid, and I need to get a way a way to pay. I, that need not necessarily be a bank account. That could be some some form of digital wallet that's provided by Vodafone or Tesco or anybody else that. Um, Bank accounts are very expensive ways of, in, of trying to include people, and they patently don't work since there are lots of people who are not included. Sorry, I, I, I understand that, but when you look, when you look at, I'm just actually looking at the um, last, I think it's a Treasury or some, uh, I think it's a Treasury Select Committee report on financial exclusion, and it points out that customers who don't have bank accounts are those with no, often that often those with no permanent address move often, right, don't exactly. have a passport, yeah, don't right. have a driving license, absolutely, and correct. a third of unbanked people have a, have had a bank account before and don't want one. Right. I'm, I, so when it comes to the overarching objective of the CBDC, I often ask. Is this the guiding objective? I think it comes back to the point you were getting to earlier. I mean, it, there are other bigger potential macro points that Lord Stern were talking about, and financial exclusion and inclusion can be dealt with in a different way. Would you not agree that? I, I agree with the priority of dealing with the inclusion issue. It, it's not good for society. There are people that are excluded. Remember, people who are trapped in a cash economy are the people who pay the highest prices for everything. They're the people that get mugged and robbed and, and, and all this kind of thing. So inclusion is really, really important. Does a CBDC in of itself help with that? That's not clear to me at all. Right. It, it's much more related to these issues around identity and, and so on. Of course, yes. Sorry. Can I just quickly just come back to um, a point just to direct to um, Stephen Bonner? If um, we introduce the CBDC along some of the lines of what you um, uh, along the lines that um, we've been discussing that Mr. Birch set out, how does this change um, or question? Does it change the Bank of England's um, uh, relationship with the ICO um, and its levels of accountability, especially? And does it drag it into a whole new realm of? Uh, privacy data issues, which clearly it does, given this conversation. And what does that mean for the bank and its relationship with other institutions? Do you think? So the the bank is no doubt already a data controller for some elements of private data, but obviously this would massively expand what was in there, and they would need to resource and skill up appropriately to discharge their responsibilities around this. And that's part of it. Or perhaps, I mean, I'm unclear on the implementation. It may not be them that runs this. They might form another entity to operate this, and they would be the controller of the data and need to have this. But absolutely, whoever is intending to operate in this space needs significant investment, resource, and 
capability to cover their privacy responsibilities. And I think that that is well understood by many of the people I talk to in this space that it needs to be done correctly. But absolutely, it would be a step change in their um, responsibilities as they move from a predominantly uh, wholesale to a much more retail environment. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to hog it. No, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in. I've got one final question. Should You started off, Mr. Birch, with a very interesting point about the focus of this, and we've been discussing primarily the um, application of CD, CBDCs in the retail sphere. Should we be focusing actually on wholesale, and we should actually be really driving headlong into that? I read today in the FT about um, uh, what the French, I think, are doing in this sphere. Um, on the wholesale markets, and are we in danger of seeking perfection on the retail front, whereas actually the competitive advantage for the city lies on wholesale? I, I, I agree completely. I mean, the, 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 the thing that makes the city a more or less attractive place to do business is the cost of doing business, and a, a, a significant way to reduce the cost of financial intermediation is through the use of wholesale digital currencies which allow people to exchange financial instruments without the clearing and settlement associated with it. And I would have thought that most institutions in the city are probably already uh, investing in this. And, and so I, I agree with you as a priority. Um, but of course, that doesn't, that doesn't include any of these issues that you're talking about today, the privacy issues. It's, it, in a way, it's easier. Yeah. yeah. Lord Fox. Just to make your life harder again, coming back to the retail situation, you, you said at the beginning, you're, you know, you're keen on it, but not yet. So what needs to happen? What are the three or four priorities that need to happen in order to make that not yet now? In other words, you know, how do we get... What needs to happen to make, to, to make it possible, from your point of view, and, and actually, Stephen, as well? Well, well for me, the priority is a, is a working digital <laughs> identity infrastructure. I mean, that would be the single most important step we could take forwards in this area. Well, on that note, um, I think it would get us. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, the, I would just clarify. You said earlier, enthusiastic. I think as an organisation, we're neutral about any of these. I, mean, I think it can offer yeah, I great think innovation. Mr. Birch was the enthusiast. Yeah, I, I just, just need to be clear on that. But that said, we have no objections, and it can be done well, I think, if the right principles are considered. So the key thing, and we're seeing strong efforts in this space to do that, is to consider these issues and turn the nebulous situation into a concrete proposal, which then clarifies many of these uh, balancing issues we face. Given um, Mr. Birch's answer to Lord Bridges' question about the threat to the city, um, isn't the pace at which this is being considered rather slow? I, outside my remit, I'm afraid I, I don't have a... Birch? I, I think work is progressing on the wholesale side of things. You know, the Bank of England have already made certain regulatory changes around the provision of omnibus accounts to allow third parties to hold tokens that will be settled in central bank digital currency. And bringing those into these new, you know, more sophisticated and more complex trading environments, I think, is, is moving. To what extent it needs regulatory change, I'm not sure. That's outside my remit. But, but it's not as if there's nothing happening, is my point. You know. Just that when we um, took um, evidence from the work which was being done by the Treasury and the Bank of England, it did seem over quite an extended period of time. On the retail side? Yeah. Yeah. But I, as I say, I'm, I'm not necessarily exercised about that. I think the risk of making a mistake is, is real. I think would highlight that if you lose trust by rushing in and not considering these issues correctly, then you put things back far further. Yeah, so absolutely. sometimes you need to go slow to go yeah. fast on the retail side. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Bonnet, Mr. Birch. Uh, it's been a very useful session, and um, we're very grateful to you for giving your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.